Okay, uh, thank you very much. So the title of the talk is Revenue or MEV Allocation in, uh, in Shared Sequencing. I'm, I'm Ben, I'm uh, co one of the co-founders and the CEO of Espresso Systems, uh, which is and also an assistant professor at Yale University. Uh, Espresso is building a shared sequencing infrastructure, which I'll talk about. So first of all, sort of the connection to this, you know, the D-Infra D conference here. So um, this, is a, this is broadly about economic alignment in decentralized infrastructure. Um, shared decentralized infrastructure, like Ethereum, right, enables trust minimized interactions between applications, but the stability of this infrastructure requires economic alignment with application development. Right, if every application could make greater revenue by running its own isolated system, then that would destroy the stability of Ethereum. Um, and we're starting, you know, this is, this is starting to manifest a bit in, in, in the way that uh, things are playing out with like app chain on Ethereum and, and, and every application wanting to become an app chain. Um, so rollups are, are beautifully horizontally scaling Ethereum, right? And application layer servers are, are essentially, you can think of, of what rollups are doing at a high level is application layer servers executing transactions and proving, uh, and proving state transitions um, that ultimately get settled uh, or verified on the layer one. Uh, and the advantages of this is that we have sharding of computation across different applications. Um, and uh, we sort of leverage the heterogeneity in the network where powerful nodes can help weaker nodes verify state. And we can have many, many weak nodes participating in layer one um, while, uh, while having more powerful nodes participate on the layer two. Um, so rollups today also run isolated sequencers uh, so they effectively run uh, very much as their own um, as their own blockchains that that ultimately settle to the same layer one at a delay, uh, and one of the drawbacks of this is that the interoperability between applications um, across rollups is more limited. Right? And you, for example, you can't have a single transaction that's going to up update multiple rollup states at once, which is also known as atomic execution. Um, the job of a sequencer is to collect transactions, um, order them, and determine some state transition, and then summarize it and, and post uh, a proof of it if it's a, if it's a ZK rollup uh, to the Ethereum network. And um, so this determines rollup blocks, right? And which transactions are included in the rollup blocks and their order. The sequencers may also run an auction, right? So if, uh, uh, if you're the sequencer of a rollup, then you might run an auction among competing builders um, in fact, there's a natural market tendency towards this because um, builders are specialized third parties that may know a better way to propose uh, the next block that can generate some kind of economic surplus that would be shared with the sequencer. Uh, and this is exactly the same dynamic that plays out with the leaders in consensus protocols. So the, 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 the leader of the Ethereum consensus protocol, which is random elected, acts as the sequencer for one Ethereum slot and may in turn run an auction. Um, so a shared sequencer architecture, um, or also known as a base rollup architecture, is where L2 nodes read the finalized transaction list from the L1 and execute to determine the state transitions. This is actually the initial design of rollups before sequencers were introduced for efficiency reasons. Um, and uh, the advantages of this is that uh, so the L1 is handling all the ordering and, and, and availability of, of, of transaction data to the rollups. It doesn't, um, it, it does not execute. And the advantages are enhanced security and decentralization, and also uh, to some degree improved interoperability, not only between uh, the rollups, but also between rollups and the layer one. Because the same proposer, or the same sequencer for an individual slot, is simultaneously constructing the L1 block and also all the rollup blocks. Um, I'm not going to go into the details. Uh, there are many subtle details of to what degree this interoperability is enabled and how it's different from being in the same execution environment. That is not the subject of the talk. I'm going to focus on the revenue allocation problem because it's a fundamental ins incentive alignment problem between not only applications in the layer one, um, but rollups in the layer one. So um, there could also be a separate layer 1.5 that's handling this job. Um, um, that could be the layer one, it could be a layer 1.5. 
So we can think of um, a shared sequencer as, as, a, as a marketplace that's, that's running some, some kind of joint auction um, where it gives rise to this auction where proposers are bidding on rollups, not in the only individual rollups, but also bundles of rollups. Um, so it, it auctions the right to update all rollups or a subset of rollups at once to bidders. Um, so proposers can promise, proposers who are then, you know, uh, who, who win the right to do this can promise atomicity of transactions or other user intents, and these are called pre-confirmations. For example, a user may say, I want my transactions on rollups A and B to execute either together or not at all. That can be satisfied by a proposer who wins the auction to propose the next block of both rollups A and B together. Um, so if we look at shared auctions versus isolated auctions, we have this picture, what it looks like today, um, where every rollup is essentially running its own auction versus a shared sequencer picture where rollups can participate together in a joint auction. Right? And the, the benefit of a shared auction is that now individual proposers can bid not only individually on the right to propose different bundles for different rollups, but they can bid a, a different value for the perhaps even more. Perhaps they would bid even higher for the right to propose two, 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 two rollup blocks together. Um, now the problem is that with this shared auction, because rollups are essentially delegating you know, the rights to run this auction to a shared infrastructure, um, the, the, the revenue that's being captured through the auction is now flowing to the shared sequencer instead of individual rollup sequencers. And we can think of it as the same problem where when applications run, when Uniswap runs on Ethereum, it sort of, it, 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 it delegates the right to auction off its block space to the L1 proposer and it's no longer running the auction itself. And so now the revenue is being captured by the Ethereum L1 and not the application. So is there a mechanism through which rollups or applications can dynamically participate in these shared auctions such that they're always better off than running in isolation? Uh, there are many analogies to this. We can think of bands playing at a music festival, a festival sells tickets. How is the ticket revenue allocated among the bands? Right? Um, travel agencies sell tickets combining flight legs for multiple airlines. How is the ticket revenue allocated among the airlines? Uh, we can think of a toy example with two companies that each manufacture left shoes and right shoes. And obviously we'd like to sell the shoes as a pair together in the, in the store. But when the shoe store auctions the pair of shoes together, how should the auction revenue be allocated among companies A and B? Uh, and the goal is to have A and B convinced that they're better off giving the shoes to the, to the store to sell together rather than trying to sell the shoes separately on their own. So a first attempt, um, let's just allow bidders to bid on the bundle of all rollups and additionally on each individual rollup. If the maximum bid that we receive on the bundle is greater than the sum of bids uh, on individual, then we would sell the bundle. Otherwise, we would sell the rollups individually. So in this case, each rollup gets the max bid um, of the individual as payout plus a proportional share of the overall revenue. So here's an example. If we have, um, let's say we have the, the bid on the bundle is 20 and we have uh, bids on A, B, C, and D, and E as three, two, three, two, and three respectively. And in this case, the sum of the individual bids for individual rollups is only 13, which is less than 20. We have a surplus value from allocating the bundle. So in this case, A, C, and E would get their max bid plus their proportional share of the surplus. So in this case, um, uh, A would get 3 plus 3 over 13, then 20 minus 13, so we would get 4.6, and B and D would get 3.1 respectively. Um, so the problem with this uh, straw man is, is something called shill bidding. So what if A suddenly inserts a fake bid for 10, right? Because now it knows that if it, if it bids for it on its own rollup, if it submits a bid for its own rollup, then it can try to get a, a, a larger cut or even, even bigger cut than it really deserves. So A could get 10 as a revenue and, and everyone else could just get three or two. 
And what if A and B bid X? Well, then the bundle bid is, not, is no longer the highest, and the rollups would get sold individually. So in this case, A and B ruined it for everyone else, and the bundle isn't sold just because A and B bid too high on themselves. Okay, so shill bidding can prevent the most eff economically efficient allocation. So the solution is to allow bids on more bundles. Right? So the problem here is that we're only allowing a bid for the entire bundle and for individual rollups. Um, and if A and B overbid, but the rest doesn't, then we need to ensure that the rest can still benefit from shared sequencing. If we allow um, bids to be submitted for any combination of rollups, then we avoid this problem. So proposers can bid on arbitrary bundles. Now, when, when, you, when you shill bid, you risk being excluded from the winning bundle. And there's a very nice property that comes from this, which is that you're guaranteed that if you don't shill bid, you will be included in the bundle. Um, now, we could also burn part of the bid in order to disincentivize uh, shill bidding further, uh, because not only would you be excluding yourself from the bundle, which has a surplus, um, but you would also be paying a fraction of your revenue in order to shill bid. So shill bidding can also be thought as functioning as a reserve price. So what is a reserve price? A reserve price is a minimum price that a seller is willing to accept from a buyer. Okay? So every rollup can post a reserve price instead of shill bidding on itself. And a rollup will only be included in a bundle by a bidder who exceeds the reserve price. Right? If no bidder is willing to include uh, a rollup in a bundle for the reserve price, then the rollup will just propose its own block, right? which sort of defaults to what is done today. But this is dynamic. And a reserve price can be dynamically adjusted. So um, we could call this ad hoc shared sequencing. It enables a marketplace for rollups to effectively sell block proposal rights by the slot to parties who are bidding and may offer them more to propose their block than they know they could make on their own. So there's a more caveat. So one problem is this is a combinatorial auction. There are many possible bundles and finding the optimal allocation can take exponential time. Um, one solution is to find a good allocation, submit it, and then allow some time for people to submit better allocations. Uh, this is sort of similar to fraud, fraud proof mechanism. Um, and you can, you can also run the auction far ahead of the natural block to enable this process. But if we run the auction far ahead of time, then bidders don't know the value of blocks. And uh, they need to bid on the expected value instead. Now the expected value doesn't change. So this means that the bidders will likely be the same winners, all the, the, be the same bidders that are always winning. Um, and that may be concerning. So a solution is to run a lottery instead of an auction. So the lottery analog of this is the following. So we can adapt the, solu the solution exactly from the, from the auction setting. Um, a, a key problem is adjusting the lottery ticket price to approximate what's effectively called a clearing price. So the shared sequencer is selling t lottery tickets for all possible bundles, setting some cap on tickets available for each sale. Um, and it can dynamically adjust the ticket uh, price for, for, the, for the ith rollup. It will be raised in the next round if the tickets, if too few tickets were sold, it will be lowered. If um, too many uh, tickets were, were, were sold, sorry, the opposite. It will be raised if too many tickets were sold. It will be lowered if too few tickets were sold. We then take the bundles such that they form a partition of all the rollups, and we can maximize the total lo lottery revenue um, by selecting the ones that maximize the revenue. Um, and then finally, ticket purchases for non-winning bundles would simply be refunded or canceled. And in each round, we would just pick uh, random tickets from the winning bundles as the sequencers for that lottery. Um, so one difference is that, you know, again, to emphasize, the difference from an auction is that in an auction, the highest bidder always win. Here, the proposer or builder with the most tickets only has some percentage chance of winning. Um, and actually, it's advantageous for you as a proposer to not necessarily buy all the tickets. 
right? You, you, can, you can make more money uh, in expectation if you don't necessarily buy all the tickets. If you're willing to bid the highest, you can pay lower for your tickets and allow some other parties to buy up the tickets. So um, a consensus view of this lottery is that this is proposer or tester separation, which is also known as execution tickets um, in now in the Ethereum community. So proposers are not elected randomly from a set of stake validators in the, as in Ethereum's consensus today. Parties are bidding for the right to become the proposer. Um, this leads to, to, to some observations about censorship resistance. So compared to forcing a common proposer on all rollups, it's better for, uh, for censorship resistance for rollups because they will always be assigned to some proposer who is willing to bid on them. Right? And in the, as, a, as a default, they can propose themselves because they can always bid on themselves. Uh, one concern is that lottery systems select more sophisticated proposers who may then censor individual transactions. Um, but this can be addressed via inclusion lists. Um, and finally, this requires the need to support multiple simultaneous proposers or leaders in the consensus. So naively, um, we can do this just by collecting quorum certificates, the technical term for, sig for, for threshold signatures and consensus protocols um, on all proposals separately. But there's so much room for efficiency optimization here. Uh, for example, there you know, uh, is the problem of aggregating uh, quorum certificates across multiple proposals. So some final thoughts. Um, analyzing the, in, in, there's more work to be done on the analyzing the incentive compatibility of this auction or lottery and the equilibrium analysis and how much of a problem for bidding really is. Um, also, is proportional allocation the best way to distribute the surplus or maybe so there's so there, there are better ways. Maybe we could use a Shapley value distribution um, and what would be the impact on the equilibrium analysis. Um, Tight-knit roll-up communities like super chains or hyper chains from these different stacks could also participate as a group, so they're always processed in a bundle. Is this compatible with base sequencing without making changes to Ethereum L1? Yes, because we can simply give the L1 proposer the right to purchase the winning tickets um, uh, at the winning price. Um, and finally, how often does the lottery need to be run? There's a trade-off between complexity and frequency. So thank you very much. And uh, if there's any time for questions, I'll... Awesome. So the way it works in Ethereum, right, is that, um, you know, builders can, like, see in the mempool and maybe have some, like, private transaction flow, and then that's how they create their bid. But... It sounds like under this construction, you're you're doing one bid for every slot, and like, I, I guess my question is, are you bidding on the like the l previous twelve seconds? In which case, are all the sequencers building like concurrent chains, and that's weird, or are you bidding on the next twelve seconds? In which case, like, how can you know what's going to happen? Because like, you know, all rollups like process way so like so much faster than that. So. Yeah, 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 really good question. So there's a difference. Um, between the job of a, of, of, of a proposer who's participating in an auction to become a proposer versus a builder who's participating in what's called a just-in-time auction. So very likely the proposer, when it's just about to build the block, will also run a just-in-time auction among builders. Um, and so it's, it's the, I mean, just-in-time auctions will have participation from searchers who are really good at, you know, finding, you know, um, like rare MEV opportunities or other things or really good at figuring out the best way to build a block, whereas uh, proposers participating in, in this lottery or auction um, should be well capitalized and they should be good at predicting the expected value and absorbing the risk over time. Yeah. Um, quick question. If you, so if we take it as, as an assumption, which I think is true, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that atomic cross-domain messaging is, is, is not a completely solved problem yet, so it, uh, removing the possibility for cross-domain MEV, what, how, how do you actually pitch a, a roll-up to use a shared sequencer when, for example, the sequencing fees from Arbitrum end up in the Ar Arbitrum DAO versus potentially going on a shared sequencing layer like Espresso? Right? How do you ha, what what's the actual value proposition for a uh, a roll up to use um, you know espresso or, or some other system? 
So this isn't this is this doesn't at all touch the revenue that's being generated within the rollups. So the the, se the sequencing revenue today comprises of you know execution revenue or gas fees that are being paid in the rollup. This is entirely has to do with o MEV and only MEV. Um, and the point here is that so th the MEV is the value that expected value that you can get from 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 the right to propose a block, right? So if you become the the the, the if you if you look at the expected value you can get from, from building for, for two different rollups together, that might be higher because now a user will be willing to pay you a tip to include transactions on both rollups. Um, and these, these are what call, are called pre-confirmation. Right? So this does enable a degree of atomicity. It's, it's backed by the collateral of the proposer. Um, there, there are also designs such as those being explored by both Polygon and ZK Sync that, that do uh, also um, enable atomic messaging with, with ZK proving, so if, uh, but it requires a degree of coordination. So if you look at Polygon's ag layer, for example, the proposer can coordinate the constru simultaneous construction of two different blocks, passing messages between them. Um, those will eventually only be settled once they have a proof, but it does require a degree of coordination. So there is additional value in having a coordinated party produce the two blocks, and this will manifest in the auction. So if a rollup sets a reserve price for its own block and says, I'm not willing to give up the right to propose my block unless someone pays me over this amount, then that's the justification for being part of it. And it's basically, it's, it's, it's only you know, a value add for you to join this marketplace. The key thing about the marketplace is that once a rollup decides to sell its proposal rights, to someone who's willing to pay it more to produce its block than it knows it can make on its own, that sale should be final. It shouldn't be able to renege. So a shared sequencer, I would say, is, is it's a shared sequencer may, 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 be a, may be a misnomer. A, shared, a shared, shared sequencing mechanism is a mechanism, one, for having a joint assignment mechanism of proposers, two different roll-ups, the special case being every roll-up has its own proposer, Another special case being there's a single proposer who proposes for all, and having a shared finality gadget over what occurred, right? So we have to have finality on the fact that, okay, these roles were allocated to these proposers, this is what was proposed, and we have shared agreement on that. Um, thanks. So how far off are we from uh, making um, sort of accurate financial estimates of the power of inclusion on multiple roll-ups, like uh, what needs to happen before we can actually start, you know, doing some historic anal analysis along these lines? So it's historic analysis on what is the surplus that can come from having, um, from having blocks from different roll-ups processed together? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, that's a really good question because it doesn't happen yet today. Um, I think that the, I think that some of this can be, you know, inferred by looking at applications, right? By looking at sort of the, if you, if you analyze the MEV on Ethereum and how much of it comes from just within individual applications versus across applications, you can get some sense of this. But um, I think the, one, the nice thing about what I'm calling here is ad hoc shared sequencing is it defaults to the special case of what happens today. So you know, if we start to experiment with ad hoc shared sequencing, then we can start to get data and see if it is increasing the revenue of rollups or not. Um, so, yeah, anyways, but it's a really